It's February 15th here in Seoul, and I'm Kim Dami. We begin with these stories making the headlines at this hour. Starting with South Korea and Cuba's forging of diplomatic ties. South Korea and Cuba established official diplomatic relations on Wednesday. Widely known as the brother country of North Korea, it is now the 193rd country which Seoul has inked diplomatic ties with. North Korea's state media reported Kim Jong-un overlooked the test firing of a new surface-to-sea missile on Wednesday, ordering a tidal defense posture near the western maritime border. Wednesday's launch marked the regime's fifth cruise missile launch this year alone. A celebration for the Super Bowl winning Chiefs in Kansas City, Missouri turned to tragedy on Wednesday after a shooting left one person dead and over a dozen injured. Police said two armed individuals were taken into custody. South Korea has officially established diplomatic relations with Cuba, a close ally of North Korea for the first time. Now, this is not the best news for the North, as the newly forged rea- relations will further ostracize the regime on the world stage. Pei has our top story. Cuba has become the 193rd country in the world to form diplomatic relations with South Korea. Seoul's foreign ministry said in a statement that the United Nations representatives for the two countries exchanged official letters in New York on Wednesday local time. It also said this marks an important turning point for South Korea in its effort to strengthen diplomacy in the Latin American region and expand diplomatic horizons. This leaves Syria as the only country among UN member states that does not have diplomatic ties with South Korea. The communist-run island was the only country in Latin America that did not have diplomatic relations with South Korea. This was mainly because it has been and continues to be a close ally of North Korea. North Korea established diplomatic ties with Cuba in 1960, and Cuba still has an embassy in Pyongyang. With South Korea and Cuba agreeing to open diplomatic relations, North Korea is expected to become more isolated on the global stage. South Korea also hopes to expand economic cooperation with Cuba. Seoul's foreign ministry said the new diplomatic ties are expected to help support Korean companies to do business in Cuba. As of 2022, the trade volume between the two countries amounted to approximately $40 million in exports and $7 million in imports. Also, Seoul aims to provide consular assistance to Koreans visiting Cuba. Around 14,000 Koreans visited Cuba annually before the pandemic. And there are about 1,000 people descended from Koreans who moved to Mexico in 1921 during Japan's colonial rule, currently living in Cuba. Pei Arirang News. North Korea claims that the cruise missile fire detected by the South Korean military on Wednesday was a test launch of a new surface-to-sea missile. The leader, Kim Jong-un, was reportedly at the site. Choi Min-jung reports. North Korea test-fired a new surface-to-sea missile on Wednesday morning under the supervision of its leader, Kim Jong-un. The regime's state-run Korean Central News Agency reported Thursday that Pyongyang test-launched the Navy's new missile named Padasuri-6. The missile reportedly flew for 1,400 seconds, a little over 23 minutes, over waters in the East Sea to hit a target. According to the KCNA, Kim was very satisfied with the results. He also ordered a stronger military defense posture along the western maritime border, which he said was frequently invaded by South Korean warships. Kim warned that if South Korea violates the maritime border that the regime has recognized, Pyongyang will regard it as an infringement of its sovereignty and an act of military provocation, leading to the use of force. The warning comes as Kim recently signaled that his regime no longer recognizes the northern limit line, the de facto inter-Korean maritime border. South Korea's Joint Chiefs of Staff detected the latest launch at around 9 a.m. Wednesday. This is the regime's fifth cruise missile launch this year. In January, the regime fired its new strategic cruise missile, the Pulhasal 3-31. Choi Min-jung, Arirang News. And on top of conventional threats, the North's cyber crimes are becoming more of a concern. South Korea's intel agency has spotted North Koreans who have been making illegal gambling sites and selling them to South Koreans. Our North Korean affairs correspondent Kim Jong-sil reports. 
Some details of the North's mysterious Office 39 were brought out into the open on Wednesday. Kyungung Information Technology Company Limited is the name of a company that makes illegal gambling sites and sells them to South Korean cyber criminals. South Korea's National Intelligence Service said Wednesday that the company operates in Dandong City, China, and is under the supervision of Office 39, one of the mysterious organizations under the Workers' Party of Korea. Office 39 is known to raise and manage the money in leader Kim Jong-un's personal slush fund. In addition, the NIS released information on key members of the office. Kim Kwang-myung, 45, the leader of the operation, is a member of North Korea's Reconnaissance General Bureau in charge of actions against South Korea. He leads 15 members. Jung Liu Song, 39, is in charge of developing cyber gambling sites and ad ranking manipulation programs. And 28 year old Chun Kwon Nook develops illegal gambling sites. The NIS stated that these individuals would make and sell various software, such as that for gambling sites for adults and teens, and were each sending $500 per person monthly to Pyongyang. They had stolen Chinese IDs and, pretending to be Chinese developers, looked for jobs online. This is because UN Security Council resolutions ban North Koreans from getting jobs overseas as the money they earn can be used to further develop the regime's nuclear capabilities. South Korean cyber criminals were working with the North Koreans because the price was cheaper and they could communicate with each other in Korean. The NIS said this was concrete proof that North Korea is deeply involved in South Korea's rising criminal cyber gambling. The country's National Gambling Control Commission announced last year that revenue from illegal gambling in the country had increased by 20 trillion Korean won, or about 15 billion U.S. dollars, in just three years. Kim Jong-sil, Arirang News. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu vowed his military will carry out a powerful operation in Rafah after civilians are allowed to leave. And according to Israel, Hamas have not sent new proposals for a ceasefire after Netanyahu rejected their initial demands. Yisin has more. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu vowed Wednesday that the Israeli forces would carry out a powerful operation in Rafah after the many Gazans who have sought refuge in the southern Gaza city are allowed to leave. In his official Telegram account, the Israeli leader said that his country will continue to fight until complete victory, adding that it will happen after the civilian population leaves the battle zones in Rafah. In a separate video message, Netanyahu said that the only way to get back the Israeli hostages would be through a combination of strong military pressure and firm negotiations, just as in the case of the 112 previously freed hostages. Meanwhile, the prime minister's office said Wednesday that no new proposals from Hamas for a ceasefire and hostage release deal were given. The office added that the prime minister insists that Israel will not yield to Hamas's outrageous demands and that a change in Hamas's positions will allow progress in negotiations. Reports say the Palestinian militant group is demanding an end to the war in exchange for the release of hostages, while Israel agrees only to a time-limited ceasefire. Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan and his Egyptian counterpart Abdel Fattah al-Sisi met in Cairo on Wednesday. Among some of the issues brought up in their talks was the ongoing conflict between Israel and Hamas, with the Turkish leaders saying the Palestinians were at the top of the agenda and that it was their priority to establish a ceasefire as soon as possible. Both leaders slammed Israel's conduct in the war in the Gaza Strip and called for a ceasefire. Erdogan, who is on his first visit to Cairo in over 10 years, vowed to work with Egypt for the recovery and reconstruction of Gaza in the medium term. News. So things are not looking too bright over in Gaza. In fact, a top UN official has warned an Israeli assault on Gaza's Rafah city could lead to a slaughter. We're joined by Professor Mason Ritchie this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Happy to be here. Uh, thanks for joining us. So top UN official Martin Griffith's comment that Israeli assault on Rafah could lead to a slaughter. This is an unusually strongly worded remark from the UN, isn't it? 
Yes, it is. Um, you know, this isn't the type of language that we're used to hearing, but it's also an extremely dramatic uh, situation uh, in Gaza. Um, you know, I think uh, you know what this tells us is a number of things about the war situation there. Um, the first of which is that you know Hamas has uh, maneuvered Gazans uh, and, and itself uh, as a fighting organization into a, a tragic, uh, catastrophic situation. Uh, I, we should, of course, recall that you know all of this in Gaza, at least in terms of the immediate situation, uh, extracting, of course, from the larger historical context. Um, you know, comes as a result of the October 7 Hamas massacre of over 1,000 Israelis with no regard to international law. However, of course, just because uh, Hamas violated the laws of war uh, and continues to do so by holding civilian hostages doesn't mean that Israel uh, has the right to violate the laws of war either. And of course, there are disturbing reports uh, that Israel uh, has not upheld international humanitarian law um, in its offensive in Gaza. Uh, and of course, it's imperative uh, in the war going forward that Israel, that Israel does so, uh, if and when it carries out uh, this invasion of Rafah. Uh, I would also point out, I think, that strategically, Israel um, has pushed Hamas, uh, along with Gazan civilians, uh, ever further south uh, in Gaza. And now the trick is to evacuate uh, civilians uh, north again uh, in order to minimize uh, civilian casualties in a Rafah invasion. This is, of course, going to be very difficult, however, as there's more than one million of them uh, mm -hmm. in Rafah, which is something like five or six times the normal population there. Uh, domestically, uh, excuse me, diplomatically, the invasion of Rafah has been in the cards for a while, um, but Egypt and the West have been working to try to delay or, or halt this invasion. Uh, the West fears a massacre, as we just heard, uh, and Egypt fears a border crisis. And I guess the last thing I'd say is the fact that there are remaining hostages complicates Israel's planning uh, enormously. Definitely. Now, The Economist reported it believes that Israel's attacks on Rafah really depend on domestic political situations as well as other factors. Professor Richie, what's your take on this? Well, uh, Israel is, Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu uh, argues, uh, that is, and his government in part argues, uh, that a successful Rafah invasion uh, would um, present a, a, a decisive change or a decisive turning point uh, in the war, uh, is it would possibly let Israel um, finally eliminate um, Yahweh Shinwar, who's the Hamas leader in Gaza, which is a, a stated uh, goal uh, of Israel, of course. Uh, it would, uh, in principle, or at least in theory, allow uh, Israel to rout uh, a number of Gaza battalions and therefore dramatically weaken uh, Hamas uh, and uh, cut off Hamas critically um, from supplies of munitions um, that come across the uh, Rafah border crossing um, from the south. This would, of course, domestically uh, help an embattled uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, as well as certain members of his government. But of course, you know, there are risks uh, of this type of invasion, uh, both domestically in terms of whether or not it fails, um, but also in terms of international reputation. Right. Professor Rishi, you mentioned this earlier. The situation in Rafah is worse than ever, with an estimated 1.5 million people crammed into such a small city. How realistic, uh, what realistic solutions or, uh, should or can there be to allow those residents to breathe? There are no good solutions there, at least none that are realistic. Um, you know, the absolute bare minimum uh, is an evacuation uh, of civilians, uh, which the Israeli Defense Force uh, says that they're confident that they can carry out. Um, but I'm not convinced, as I think a lot of other people are as well. Uh, and among other questions, of course, the big one is where? Where are they going to go? Mm -hmm. uh, they've already been uh, driven uh, south to Rafah uh, from north and central Gaza. Uh, many of them have relatively recently arrived in Rafah from Khan Yunis. So one option would be, of course, uh, to reevacuate them back to Khan Yunis, but it's bombed out. Uh, so there's not a lot of uh, possibility for uh, appropriate uh, humanitarian uh, conditions there. Uh, another option is central Gaza, but Israel has a relatively tenuous hold on that um, recently, so that doesn't seem like a great option. 
uh, and then going back into northern Gaza could, in principle, be an option. But Israel doesn't seem to to want that in part because it tries to it's trying to work out some concepts there for governance going forward, and this would complicate it by having a large chaotic influx influx of people. There are no good options there. It's an absolute disaster uh, in all ways uh, for the civilian population of Gaza. Right, especially with the UN pledging not to help any forced evacuation. Things are really complicated at the moment. Now, before I let you go, Professor Ritchie, aren't ceasefire negotiations between Israel and Hamas still ongoing, though? How is it looking this time? Well, so far as we can tell, it doesn't seem like, uh, you know, there is a lot of overlap between the position of Hamas and the position of Israel. Um, you know, but of course, we should never say never. Uh, the United States is obviously pushing uh, along with its partners in the Middle East, including uh, Egypt and Saudi Arabia, uh, you know, to try to find solutions uh, for uh, a ceasefire. Uh, Hamas has so far rejected uh, the, those types of offers that it's seen so far, and Israel has also rejected what it's seen on the table so far. Uh, so those, you know, those diplomatic negotiations are are ongoing, uh, but they're extremely tricky because of the lack of overlap between the Israeli and the Hamas position, mixed with the fact that these are extremely complicated negotiations, and ultimately, as we sometimes say in diplomacy. Nothing is settled until everything is settled. And because this is such a complicated situation, it's hard to get all of the details worked out. And any one detail that goes wrong could unravel an entire deal. Right. All right. Thanks so much uh, for joining us and sharing your insight to today. Professor Ritchie, you have a great day. Great. Thanks. I appreciate it. You too. A South Korean state-run think tank projects the country's economy to expand 2.2 percent this year on the back of a strong recovery in chip exports. However, weak consumer spending due to high interest rates is still a lingering factor. Our economic correspondent Lee Soo-jin has more. The Korea Development Institute has maintained its economic outlook estimate for this year at 2.2 percent. In its revised forecast published Wednesday, the South Korean state-run economic think tank kept its outlook unchanged from its November 2023 estimate. The KDI, which typically releases economic outlook comprehensive reports in May and November, also released two additional revised forecasts in February and August last year to reflect the rapidly changing economic conditions. November's economic growth estimate for 2024 at 2.2% was slightly lower than the 2.3% forecast in May and August. The think tank has kept its estimate unchanged in this year's report as exports are expected to continue to see a recovery. Total exports were estimated to grow 4.7%, up from KDI's original forecast as the chip sector shows signs of improvement. Concerns about external factors are slightly mitigated as the International Monetary Fund last month raised economic outlooks for major economies from its previous estimate released in October last year. China's economic growth was adjusted upward on the back of government stimulus measures despite the ongoing real estate crisis in the country. And growth in the U.S. economy is expected to boost South Korea's exports. The IMF also upgraded its outlook for the world economy to 3.1 percent, pointing to a more resilient growth in the global economy this year. Domestic demand, however, continues to remain sluggish amid a recovery in exports and improvements in the global economy. For consumer inflation, the KDI revised downward its forecast slightly to 2.5 percent from 2.6 percent. And private spending, which was also adjusted downwards by 0.1 percent, is not expected to show drastic improvement anytime soon. The current sluggishness in private consumption is attributed to the persisting high interest rates, hindering immediate improvement. It's unlikely to expect a boost in private consumption this year as high interest rates are likely to continue. And risk factors from geopolitical tensions in the Middle East that could lead to rising oil prices and trade disruptions might also weaken South Korea's economic growth. Lee Soo-jin, Arirang News. South Korean swimmer Hwang Sun-woo qualified for the men's 100-meter freestyle final at the 
World Championships in Qatar, becoming the first swimmer ever from South Korea to do so. On Wednesday, Huang finished third in the semifinals, coming in at 47.93 seconds, qualifying as one of the best eight finishers from the semifinals. Huang, who won the 200-meter men's freestyle gold earlier this week, will be chasing another medal on Thursday evening local time. Good morning. I'm Kim Xiong, and now we turn off the stories from around the world. We begin today in the United States, where the shooting in Kansas City following the parade for the Kansas City Chiefs Super Bowl win has left at least one person dead and 22 injured. The shooting took place near Kansas City's landmark Union Station. According to the local fire department, three victims are reportedly in critical condition, five in serious condition, and one suffered non-life-threatening injuries. Information on other casualties are not yet confirmed. The Kansas City police have confirmed that three people have been detained following the shooting. Authorities estimate around one million fans and parade goers had been at Wednesday's Super Bowl celebration, along with some 600 law enforcement officials. In Indonesia, presidential candidate Prabowo Subianto has declared victory following a quick count of votes from Wednesday's presidential election. Unofficial quick count tallies by independent pollsters showed Subianto winning with more than 55% of the vote. As the official tally of results by the election commission is yet to be released, Prabowo's rivals Anis Baswedan and Ganjar Pranowo have not yet conceded defeat. After Prabowo declared victory, Baswedan commented, we will wait until the official results and we will respect it, calling on supporters to monitor the official account. The Election Commission's official count is expected to be published within the next 35 to 40 days. To win, a single presidential candidate needs to get at least 50% of the votes cast. If 50% is not met, the top two candidates will compete in a runoff. The new president will be sworn in on October 20th. In business news, one of the world's top chip makers, NVIDIA, surpassed Google parent company Alphabet in total market value on Wednesday. NVIDIA's market value hit $1.83 trillion at its peak on Wednesday, compared to Alphabet's $1.82 trillion at the same time. The stock value boost comes days before the leading graphic card maker's fourth quarter results are due to be released on February 21st, which Wall Street expects to hit $11.5 billion. Earlier this week, Nvidia overtook retail giant Amazon's market value, with a 50% surge so far just this year. It's now the third largest American company and fourth largest in the world by market value behind Microsoft, Apple and Saudi Aramco. In New York City's Times Square, Valentine's Day was made extra special for a handful of couples who were given the opportunity to get married at Manhattan's iconic public square. Despite the cold weather, three couples read their wedding vows under Times Square's shining billboard lights in front of an ice sculpture designed by artist Lavi Pinata. Standing almost three meters tall and made from 68 blocks of ice, the sculpture entitled Smitten was the centerpiece for the Valentine's Day festivities. Times Square Alliance Vice President of Arts and Culture, Jean Cooney, said that the sculpture is an ode to newly kindled love in the cold winter season. Good morning. Hope you have your umbrella with you, a winter mix is in store nationwide. And right now, central regions in Jeollado provinces are seeing light rain, which will gradually spread to most parts of Korea. 5 to 20 millimeters of rain is in store for most places. East of Gangwon-do province could see heavier rain or snow. Mountainous regions in Gangwon-do province could see up to 15 centimeters of snowfall. So please brace for heavy snow through this evening. Regarding the temperatures, Seoul had a high of 18.3 degrees Celsius, the second highest February temperatures since 2004 yesterday. But today's wet conditions will bring down temperatures rapidly to the freezing side by tomorrow morning.
After the highs could go down to the 10 degrees lower this afternoon at 7 degrees here in Seoul, but Daegu and Jeju will be still warm at 15 degrees. It will get chillier as the day goes on, but spring warms returns just in time for the weekend. That's Korea for you, and here's a look at the international weather conditions. We thank you for watching New Day and Arirang. We'll be back tomorrow for Friday's edition at the same time, 9 a.m. Korea time.